would turn to uh, the book of Judges, chapter 2. That's where we're going to begin. I'm sorry, not chapter 2, chapter 14. I don't know what I was thinking. We're done with chapter 2, are we? Chapter 14. And as you're doing that, let us remind ourselves why we are here. This is just the huddle. Out there is where we play the game, right? Gosh, these jackets are getting tighter. Last week, I wasn't going to say anything. Now, and people keep giving me cookies. Yeah, you know who you are? Telling me to eat just one. Yeah, right. <sighs> I know. This is just the huddle. Out there is where we play the game. We remind ourselves each week of this. Um, and, uh, and sometimes the huddle, uh, inside the huddle, things go according to plan. And sometimes inside the huddle, they don't always. So, if you want to see Libby's video... Um, she'll put it on Facebook later today, uh, and you can see it there. I guess the thing froze up, and it happens sometimes, but uh, look, we move on, and we're back uh, going into this. Now, I do need to say, um, not to get your hopes up too much, uh, I think you know me by now, well enough by now, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon that has no points to it. <laughs> I didn't say it didn't have a point. It does not have points in an outline. It always has a point, and this one has a point. But it does not have points that we're going to walk through. So if you want to take notes, flip something around where you can take notes. There's a lot of things in here. But there is not an outline that we're going to follow today to see what God uh, has for us in his word. But nevertheless, uh, we are looking at Judges 14. And we're back in uh, Samson's life and his marriage this time. And I want to read through chapter 14. So if you would, uh, st stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. The word of the Lord says, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Go get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. After some days, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on, eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, Let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give, you shall give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. And they said to him, Put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother, and shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted, and on the seventh day he told her, because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people, and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down thirty men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had took the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. Pray with me. 
Father, we come before your word again, needing direction, needing guidance from your Holy Spirit. You have promised us that your spirit will lead us into all truth. And so that's what we're asking for this morning. Would you give us truth this morning through your word? Would you highlight the person and the work of your son, Jesus? Would you call those that are in this room, those that are online watching or will watch later, will you call them uh, to life from death? Will you convict them of their sin and their desperate need of Jesus as we see here in Judges 14? Lord, we want to make much of you and, and glorify you in all that we think, say, and talk about and then respond to in this next few minutes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, you can have a seat. Uh, today, I want to address the necessity of making right judgments. The necessity of making right judgments. So have you ever misjudged someone or misjudged a situation? Maybe you didn't take all the facts in. Maybe you didn't uh, hear it right. Maybe you misunderstood something. Maybe you missed that, uh, maybe you didn't see something right. Maybe you missed that bottom step, right? We've all been there. Maybe you uh, hit the gas instead of the brake. People misjudge uh, other people every single day. I was looking this up and considered these, I love reading these text messages and these type of things where we misjudge the situation and people. Look, this one right here. One, tech, one, one person said, hey, we should go to IHOP today. It's free pancake day. The person, the lady responded, who this? That's what it says. Who's this? Besides, I'm happily married with five kids. And, and this is not my wife, by the way. So, <clears throat> Besides, I'm happily married with five kids. And I don't think my husband would like it if I went out to eat with you. Besides that, I wouldn't waste my time with you since you, you want to just take me only out, or out to only uh, to give me free pancakes. And the reply was, Mom, it's Gracie. <laughs> Misjudgment, right? Or what about this one? This is a little pop culture, but, you know, just go with me here. One text, it said, John won't go to bed. Do you think it's okay to let him watch tonight's Game of Thrones? And the reply said, are you insane? Absolutely not. There's way too much going on. He'll be completely lost. He has to start from season one. It won't make any sense. <laughs> I don't watch the show. Never have, but just don't. But... Pop culture-wise, that's not a good thing. Both people misjudged the situation, didn't they? See, you probably wouldn't admit it um, out loud, but we misjudge people in situations all the time. It happens through text messages like these. It happens when you get on Facebook it, and those arguments. It's in Walmart when you see the mom who, I mean, she looks like she's about to put her kid on a milk carton. But what you don't see is that you don't see how much she really loves her child and all the other stresses of her life. And, and it happens when we see the sketchy looking guy walking on the same sidewalk toward us and our first reaction is, I'm gonna go to the other side of the street. We do this all the time. So what does God say about that? Well, in John 7, 24, Jesus, who is teaching at this time in the temple during the Feast of Booths, he said, do not judge by, our, or by appearances but judge with right judgment. Don't judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Don't look at the outside, Jesus says, but make a right judgment. Christians, above all people, should make right judgments. We are people of not just the book, but people of truth. And we should make right judgments. As believers, we are called by Jesus, yet empowered by the Spirit, to make Right judgments, to judge rightly, not by mere appearances. Here's our big idea and what we're going to uh, unfold and unpack today. Misjudging people can often or it can cost us dearly in life and in eternity. Misjudging people can cost us in life and in eternity. And Christians, we are called to make right judgments based on truth, not on just mere appearances of truth. And don't we see that all around today? Everybody has a truth. It's relative truth. What's true for you is not necessarily true for me. Um, it's all around us all the time. But we are called to make judgments based on truth, of what truth really is, truth according to the Bible. So again, we're going to turn to Samson here, chapter 14. And the book of Judges, it often contains some of the most well-known stories 
of the Bible, but also the least preached stories of the Bible. And it's no wonder it's one of the least preached books of the Bible, because, it, because many just don't know what to do with this book. I mean, we've talked about this already. The judges are often seen as part of Israel's greater downfall. That they are characterized as immoral people that God just uses anyway in his grand sovereign plan. And as Samson, he's probably the greatest example of this type of thinking. And in fact, I've one commentator writing on Samson in this particular lion carcass, this is what he says. Samson's perversity knows no bounds. His parents had sanctified him, but now, because he gave him the honey, he desecrates them. Another pastor author says, Samson was brash and reckless, arrogantly believed himself to be invincible. He became a man driven by fleshly desires, especially his illicit and unrestrained passion for pagan women. Wow. Okay. What if they're wrong, though? What if we've misjudged one of God's greatest servants in the Bible. I know this. I sure wouldn't want to be in heaven walking by, you know, the weight room and Samson's hanging out there and said, hey, I read what you uh, wrote about me. <laughs> or, hey, I, I, I heard what you preached about me. Hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to take a positive view and approach toward the judges. Not because, you know, maybe we're, you know, more of a glass half full kind of person no because scripture takes a positive view we've already mentioned uh, in the days in past hebrews 11 the the faith hall of fame samson is one of those examples of great faith that we are to uh, display um, we also can go to john 5 39 listen to jesus's words you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they who bear witness about me jesus said samson is bearing witness about me so the topic today is not merely just about misjudging Samson, but something more important, that if we misjudge Samson, we're also in danger of misjudging Jesus. That's a problem. All scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God or woman of God, boy and girl of God, can be equipped for every good work. So if that's true, and it is, then we have to judge rightly when we get to Judges 14. So here's what we're going to do. For the next few moments, I want to show you at how easily we misjudge someone like Samson. And then I want to show you how we should judge rightly uh, when it looks to Samson by drawing parallels from Samson to Jesus. And then we'll end with a challenge. So to do this, um, you need your Bible or the the. the uh, Verses will probably be on the screen too, but we're going to take our Bible and we're going to take a trip through Judges 14. You see, Judges 14 is centered on four different trips that Samson takes to this town called Timnah. And so let's walk this together uh, with Samson and see what we find out. Verse 1, we see that Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. So Timnah was this location, this city that was situated north of Dan, the tribe of Dan, but south of Philistia. They were right in the middle, but they don't have their own people there. It's the Philistines have taken over all the land, and so you have all these Philistines that are, leave, that are living there in Timnah. And so Samson, it says he kind of made his way down to Timnah, so he's walking around the countryside, and he notices a daughter of the Philistines. Now think about it. Let's just stop right there. Any red-blooded, you know, single male seeing another single female, who in the world would not hesitate to go and try to meet this person? Nobody, right? Any male would do that. That's what guys do. But that's not what we see here. It's, we don't see the picture of an out-of-control, steroid-induced, sex-crazed guy here, like one of the commentators said earlier. What does he do? Instead of going to the girl, where does he go? He went back to his parents. Then he came up and told his father and mother, verse 2. I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me. So who goes back and tells their parents? He wants their blessing in this marriage. He wants their involvement in it. He cares about what they're going to say about this person. So of course, like any Jewish parents, they're going to have objections to this. Verse 3, 
But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all of our people? Is there not anybody in Dan? Is there not anybody in Israel that you would rather marry than si besides this pagan or this uncircumcised Philistine? And so Samson's response here is very important. So what does he say? He responds to his parents, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. That's going to come up a couple times. For she is right in my eyes. What does that mean? That is, that's important enough that we need to underline that when we're studying the Bible and say, what does that mean? Well, there's three possible meanings here. It could mean that um, he's willing to go outside of you know, uh, his own people, um, maybe. But uh, it could mean that it's just a connection to the other phrase in Judges. Everyone did what was or evil, what was right in their own eyes. It could mean that. Um, it could mean also probably more that she is uh, pure and a moral person. Not that she's perfect, but she's an upright character. Um, Samson would want to marry someone. He has a Nazarite vow. And if he can't find anybody in Dan, we've already talked about Dan. They, they're, they're the one who just gave up their inheritance and moved north and attacked this other unsuspecting village. So he can't find anybody in Dan and he can't find anybody in Israel at this time that's uh, a, at least upright in character. He's going to go outside of that. So it could be that she's upright in character. She's a good moral person. Specifically, I believe when I was researching, mean, I believe it's this number three. When I was researching this, this phrase came up a lot in different areas of the Bible. Is that it could mean that, that it's just the right thing to do. She's right in my eyes. It's the right thing to do. Why is it the right thing to do? Well, look at verse four. Which, by the way, the other commentator that was so hard on Samson brushed past this without even a mention. I don't understand that. Mm. His father and mother did not know that it was from who? The Lord. That she was right in his eyes because God said she was right in his eyes. He saw her and God told him, that's the girl you need to marry. So what about marrying a Philistine girl? He gets tagged as, you can't marry a pagan like that. Well, I mean, you wouldn't want to be unequally yoked. That's true. But here, this is not that kind of idea because the Canaanites or the Philistines were not Canaanites. They were commanded to not marry Canaanites. Philistines were really new in the land at this time. Uh, they had not been there long. The Canaanites had had 400 years of building up immorality and idolatry. The Philistines had not. They had taken over the land. So the, the Philistines were not necessarily off limits to God's people. And although Samson probably does love this girl because he gets really angry at the end when he's not able to marry her. I mean, who wouldn't, right? But Samson has mo something more important on his mind. It's he's looking for an opportunity to fulfill his calling that the Lord has placed on him to begin to defeat the Philistines. Now, if he sees this girl, he goes back to his parents and he's looking for this opportunity to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Does this sound to you like a loose cannon? No. To me, that sounds like somebody who's very strategic about walking out, living out the call that God has on his life. Let's keep going. Second trip to Timnah. Verses 5 and 6. So Samson this time took his parents with him. He wants them to meet her. Somewhere along the way, when his parents were not right immediately with him, this lion charges out at him. Verse 6. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion to pieces, or in pieces, as one tears a young goat. That's pretty awesome. The Spirit of the Lord came upon other judges like Othniel and Gideon and Jephthah, and now upon Samson. But you need to notice that it wasn't Samson's great strength. Remember, we showed that picture. Who, who still has that picture in their mind of what Samson was probably more like than we think of him in like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but really he was like this probably scrawny guy. We don't know that biblically, but just how God operates, taking the weak of the world and making his strength strong through them, that's how God operates. And so here, it's not because Samson had spent every day for the last 20 years in the gym that he was able to take this lion down. He did it because God strengthened him to do it. It was the Lord's strength. Just as when David, in 1 Samuel 17, told Saul, I'm not scared of that Philistine giant out there because the lion attacked me and the, the Lord delivered me from the mouth of the lion. 
So if God's strength is good there, he's good also anywhere. It is God's strength that is delivering Samson here. So he doesn't tell his parents that what happened. He's going to use that later for their benefit. They just don't know it yet. And he goes to talk now with this Philistine woman. And he finds out this phrase again. She was right in Samson's eyes. So now think about this. He sees her from a distance. He says, she's right in my eyes. Sees her from a distance. Now he went to talk with her. And what he witnessed from a distance now was confirmed up close in a conversation. Again, does this, someone, does this sound like someone who has no control? He just killed a lion. I think if I did that, if I wanted a bride, I think I would go get one. But he doesn't do that. He goes to talk with this woman. He needs to know for himself, is the person up close the same person I saw from a distance? And he finds out that she is. Third trip to Timna, verse 8 and 9. In this section, where after some days he returned to take her, he's claiming her for his bride. That was not something you know misogynistic. This was what happened during that time. He turned aside and he saw this carcass of the lion that he had killed earlier. So what's happening? Well, one of the most common reasons for viewing Samson negatively comes from this in the following sections. It deals with the question of whether or not Samson broke his Nazarite vow. The vow is laid out in number six and it just basically said he couldn't eat or drink anything from any kind of fruit. He couldn't cut his hair and he couldn't touch a dead body. So when Samson gets the honey from the dead animal, the carcass of the lion, did he break his Nazarite vow? I'm going to say he did not break his Nazarite vow, and there's four reasons that I say this. Um, first, the Nazarite vow prohibited touching a dead body, a dead human body, specifically stated in number 6, 6 through 8. So what about that he touched an animal that was unclean um, at that point, because Leviticus does talk about not touching unclean animals. Great question. I'll get back to that in a second. When the vow was broken, and it was broken, the Nazarite vow was broken in Judges 16, 17, in the case of Delilah, who was another Philistine woman needing to know a secret that Samson had. So we'll get to that later. But when that vow was broken, it specifically mentioned the prohibition of the Nazarite vow that time. So if it mentioned it in Judges 16 and the vow was broken, why didn't it mention the writer feel that it was needed to be mentioned in Judges 14? Number three, it was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon Samson. That's what we read, right? The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson, and he tore this lion to pieces with what? His bare hands. So if he's not able to touch a dead animal, but yet he does this anyway, and it was the Lord directing him to do it, then number four is most likely. God gave Samson special concessions because of his special calling to touch dead things because his calling was a warrior and to, to solidify that he not only kills a lion with his bare hands but in Judges 15 we'll see that he picks up a bone the jawbone of a donkey and he goes to town and kills a thousand Philistines so God in a way is saying Samson's calling to himself uh, as a Nazarite is actually secondary to obedience to God in this God has made special concessions for Samson to fulfill his calling in life. And so after these days, or after some days, it says what most likely happened was that uh, these bees had set up residence in this dried out lion carcass. He scraped some honey out. He gives some to his family without telling them um, because he doesn't want to endanger their life later. We'll get to that in just a second. So he's patiently waiting on the Lord. This would have taken months to take place. The lion has to dry out. Bees have to come. They have to build a hive. They have to make the hive. These all take, this doesn't happen in a week. It's, like he, it's not like he goes home and comes back a few days later and there's magically a dead animal with bees in it. This takes months to take place. Again, does this sound like someone who's rushing what God wants him to do? No. It's somebody that's very methodical, somebody that's very strategic, very patient, and waiting for God to act. Fourth trip, final trip, verses 10 through 18. This time we're told that uh, in verse 10 that his father went down with Samson to Timnah. So now his father goes because he wants to meet with the woman. He has the authority to do that, and so he did that. And so obviously he sees what Samson saw in her because 
He doesn't stop the wedding. There's nowhere in here that he says, you know what? This is not a good idea. We're not giving you our blessing. Wedding's off. He had every right custom, uh, customarily to be able to do that. He doesn't do that. Samson prepares a feast, which was also customary for the groom to do. So could a Nazarite, we obviously know that a Nazarite couldn't drink any fruit juice of any sort or anything like that. So did he break his vow and was he a drunk? As some commentators talk about him being. Well, read the text. I wish we would just read the text sometimes. Good night. There are nowhere in here, 10 through 18, will you ever find anything, unless your translation has specifically marred that translation, you will not find anything in there that says he drank anything, nor even implies that he drank anything. Where it all comes from is a Hebrew word for feast is the, from the same root word for to drink. But just because Samson hosted the party does not mean that he partied so much that he broke his Nazarite vow. In fact, I like what uh, Dr. Van Pelt over in Jackson said about this. He said, having grown up in a time of extended wedding feasts, Samson would have attended any number of feasts in his lifetime. And his vow would have prohibited partaking of alcohol at all such feasts. Not just this one, all of them. Samson would have been a well-trained teetotaler by this time. There was no way that Samson was going to touch anything in this regard. Because God had not let him do, God had not given him permission to, God had not worked in that way. Nowhere in there does it say that he did that. So the rest of this, this section here is all on the narrative of Samson's riddle, which we'll, we'll talk about in the next section. But I want you to see, what, or what we've seen so far, is that what we see is a man who has a special vow to God that controls him. A man who has a special calling from God to begin to defeat the Philistines and a special empowering from God, the spirit of the Lord rushing upon him, which he's already killed a lion with his bare hands. Misjudging people can cost us in life and in eternity. We are to judge rightly, not by appearances. Now, that's how we misjudge somebody like Samson often. But what are the parallels? How do we judge rightly? In the next few moments, I want to show you four of these so the parallels between Samson and Jesus. Hold on now. This is the best part. There are 31, 31 allusions or quotations in the New Testament that the New Testament writers use about Samson and take from Samson and use for Jesus. 31. That's a lot. And here, I'm just going to show you four that are very brief, but we'll look at these. The parallel of empowerment. The parallel of empowerment. The Spirit of the Lord coming upon them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson in verses 6 and 19. The, in verse 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, one of the five, uh, that's one of the five Philistine capitals, and he struck down 30 men of the town. He took their spoil, took their garments. Guess what we see in Matthew 3? Jesus read, uh, or he, he, in Matthew 3, we read that the Spirit of God came down upon Jesus at his baptism. Verse 16, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. So the Spirit of the Lord, Yahweh, came upon each man to empower them for ministry, to empower them to fulfill their call, with which we see in the very next case, the parallel of the wedding feast. Now get this, this blows me away. Both men were empowered by the Lord to do something specific, which includes defeating God's enemies. Both men were empowered by the Lord, but also both men launched their public ministry, guess where? At a wedding feast. Guess how? By providing the booze. They did. Jesus, in John chapter 2, he turns water into wine. He saves the best for last. And we find out in verse 11 that he glorifies himself. It is the first time that his disciples see who he is, see what his ministry is going to be about. God is doing a new thing through Jesus. Samson launches his public ministry by providing for this wedding feast as any groom would do. And then he shows the extent of his uh, ministry, or at least a beginning of his ministry, as he defeats these uh, guys in Ashkelon. This is not an accident when the New Testament writers 
um, bring this out and highlight this, that Jesus began his public ministry at a wedding feast providing wine, guess what? Samson did too. Parable of the parallel of the parables. Twice in Judges 14, Samson uses a parable to teach. Verse 14, out of the eater came something sweet. Out of the strong came something, uh, something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. These are riddles. This is a riddle, but this is a parable. So when they guessed it through coercion and threat to Samson's bride, Samson responds with another parable. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Well, Samson was a farm boy. Basically, he's saying they gained their information through illicit means. You don't plow with another man's heifer. Okay, you don't sleep with another man's wife. How about that? That would be easier to say in our context. Jesus spoke to people. How? In parables. Parable of the sower, parable of lost sheep, lost coin, prodigal son. There's a bunch of them in there. Matthew 13, 34. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. So they're empowered to do ministry. They launch their ministry. They teach about their ministry through parables. And then lastly, I want to show you the parable of the revealed answers. Because it's not just about the parable, but it's about how the information is given out. When Samson's wedding companions couldn't figure out the riddle, where did they go? They threatened the one closest to him, the bride. This is why Samson did not bring his father and mother into this. He wasn't trying to endanger their life. They didn't need to know anything about this. They had threatened. It was so serious that they didn't want to lose so much money in these. Uh, by the way, we can make another distinction between 30 and 30 in the Old Testament and New Testament. But we're not going to. You can do that study. 30 pieces of garments, 30 pieces of silver. I'll let you kind of work that out. But what he's doing is he's, uh, they don't want to pay this much money. And so they're going to threaten her and her father's house to kill them, to burn them. And so on the fourth day, verse 15, they said to Samson's wife, here's their threat, they're threatening her. And then finally, after questioning Samson's love for her, and because she pressed him hard, in verse 17, she, he ends up telling her. So the question here is, and I've already given you the answer, but so it's an easy one, but who did Samson reveal the parable answer to? Her, right? His bride, the one he loved, the one closest to him. Not his wedding companions, not his family, the one closest to him, the bride. Do you know how Jesus revealed the parables? To those that were closest to him. His bride, the church. Matthew 13, 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parables of the weeds of the field. And so Jesus went on to explain to them. And then lastly, the parable of the battle. For Samson and Jesus both fought for their bride. Samson goes down to Ashkelon. He defeats these 30 Philistines, which he wanted to do anyway. He's fighting for his bride, but it cost him greatly because he did not get the bride. Jesus fought for his bride. He was beaten. He was publicly ridiculed. He was spit upon. He was mocked. He was crucified on a cruel Roman cross, and he gets his bride. When we, as people, see what Christ has done for us on the cross and we turn to him through repentance and in faith, when we judge rightly what the Bible says about us, that all of us have sin and all of us fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, when we judge rightly by that and we turn to Jesus as the only way to be saved, the only way to grow in Christ's likeness, the only way to bring glory to God in our life, when we judge rightly like that, Jesus wins that battle. Jesus gets his bride. Jesus defeated our greatest enemy. Jesus defeated sin, death, and the grave. And he gets his bride. My question for you is, are you judging rightly and are you part of that bride? Are you part of that wedding feast? It's one thing to misjudge a person like Samson, but when we misjudge someone like Jesus, the consequences are eternal. Are you judging Jesus rightly? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father except through me. Is Jesus the only way for salvation for you? Or are you trying every other thing possible in this world to get to heaven? There's only one way. There's only one way to 
uh, experience the new life that God has for you. It's through Jesus. We don't misjudge as people of truth. We judge rightly. Judge Jesus by what he says about himself. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He loves us. He died for us. And he is alive today for us. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us in the person and the work of your son. Father, we pray that we would judge rightly in all matters of faith and practice. God, that we judge based not on what we think and what our personal truth may be at this moment in time, but God, on what your timeless truth in the Bible says. And it says that we need Jesus more than we need the air that we breathe right now. So, Father, for those that don't know Jesus right now, would you continue to draw them to yourself? Would I pray for them that they would have the faith to turn from their sin and turn to the Lord Jesus in full belief in what he has accomplished on the cross for them? Father, for those others of us in here that are saved, but God, we struggle making right judgments. Would you give us a passion for seeking out truth like the Bereans had, seeking out truth in your word? Father, we love you, we honor you, and we want to give you this time of response. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a decision.